Our next presenters, I'll introduce one. Colleen Price has been with us since 2012. She's the Director of Wellness and Recreation here at Stetson. Uh, she has her BS in Marketing and Management from Siena College, her Master's in Sport Management from the University of San Francisco, and Colleen provides leadership and supervision to our Wellness and Recreational Support Department. Uh, outdoor adventure activities, sports officiating, and she truly is one that shares her passion for health and fitness in her leadership position at the Hollis Center. Um, she's all about Stuart, uh, student empowerment in the Hollis Center. So welcome, Colleen. And also joining her for this session, which is our health, sa uh, Healthy and Safe Campus, is a close friend of mine who I love introducing each year because I get to embarrass him. So. Bob Matusik is amazing, and he gets embarrassed when I introduce him because I think it's important that you as parents know who is in charge of our emergency management at Stetson University. And when you hear this, you'll be grateful that I embarrassed him once again this year. Um, Bob uh, started with us, is it eight years ago now, Bob? Eight years, he's been with Stetson since eight years. He retired from the Volusia County Sheriff's Office where he had a 30-year career there he rose from deputy to major. He was the high-risk incident commander for SWAT. He ran the SWAT team for Volusia County for many, many, many years. He still serves sometimes when they need him to come and help. He worked on hostage negotiations. He's considered to be one of the best in the state. And because of that, he is an adjunct professor at the criminal justice uh, department at Daytona State Beach, or, sorry, Daytona Beach Community College. Everything else you can think about in the Sheriff's Department, Bob has done it. He leads our emergency management team here on campus, and most importantly, he is the dad of two young women in their 20s, so he gets it. He's a dad. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Colleen and Bob to the stage. What Raina forgot to say is, yes, I have two daughters, that's why I have no hair. <laughs> and uh, I'm back to work again, so after I retired. So my wife kicked me out after three months and said, you got to go back to work because I was spending too much time at home driving her crazy. So Colleen, if you would. Yes, absolutely. We're really excited to have you here and talk a little bit about your students' safety on campus um, and their health as well. That was touched on a little bit in their residential experience, but we're going to go into some more detail about that. So today we're really going to make sure we introduce some of those specific campus resources that are available, um, talk a little bit about them advocating for their safety as well, um, utilizing you as our partners, you are our co-pilots in this, and then we're going to touch a little bit on Title IX um, and some of the requirements and programs and services that we offer through that. So one of the big questions I get asked every year, and I, I, I saw a lot of you guys yesterday and last night, but just just to go through this is, is crime on campus. Every year we, we publish what's called our Clary statistics, and, and this is what we published this year. And as you see, I mean, while we are, are not exempt from crime, we have a relatively low crime rate. Our biggest issue that we have is liquor law violations. The majority of them are referrals. As you can imagine, college life, we have, we have students that are under the age of 21 that for some reason, I have no idea how, I don't know, I, I didn't do this in college, but they went out and they found some way to get beer and bring it back to their dorm room or whatever. So that's our biggest issue. The other one is burglaries. You'll see that listed up there. And, and just to be clear on burglaries, none of those numbers up there were a forced entry in anything. We have students that leave their doors unlocked, propped open, and they come back and their laptop's missing or something, so somebody's wandered into their room. So we always tell everybody, look, make sure you lock your stuff up, inventory what you have here, write the serial numbers down so we can track it down. So those are our big two events that we have here. This is just a snapshot of what we do at Public Safety. We have a 24-hour day, seven-day a week patrol operation. Uh, our dispatchers are on duty 24 hours a day. Anytime you call, it comes directly into our dispatch center. Uh, we have four officers on every shift that work uh, around the clock. We do have uh, patrol vehicles we use. The primary vehicles, and you've seen them throughout the last couple of days, are golf carts. We can get around this campus, and albeit it's 200 acres, we can get around the campus very quickly on golf carts rather than using vehicles. So that is our primary mode of transportation. Uh, we do nighttime safety escorts. Uh, we write incident reports. Last year, we, I mean, we wrote probably 3,000 reports 
uh, over the course of a year, and the majority of that are just things like, uh, you know, I lost a book, I lost this, I lost that, uh, somebody vandalized my car. We have cars that are left unlocked, and, and, and somebody will go through and look for change, things like this. So we, I mean, we do docu document those things to have it here on record. Uh, we also uh, enforce the parking policies. So you might get a phone call or a bill from your student because they've got parking tickets and they, they, maybe they'll tell you that I had no idea I was parked in the wrong place or I have no idea why they wrote me that ticket. Trust me, they know why they got the ticket and, and they know they were parked in the wrong place. We do a great job at trying to educate everybody where they can and can't park. So uh, if you do get that phone call, please ask them a little bit about that. Also, we staff a lost and found. Uh, even yesterday, uh, and in case somebody's missing some keys, yesterday after the session uh, at the Edmond Center, we had sunglasses, car keys, cell phones, all kinds of things that were left over at the Edmond Center. So if you're missing that property, we maintain a lost and found at public safety. Emergency management. It's a big issue here on campus. We do have an emergency management plan. Uh, the weather. Uh, on, on our campus is just like any weather throughout the state of Florida. It sometimes can, can be rather nasty quick. Uh, we have implemented a ThorGuard lightning detection system. I don't know if you've heard it yet or not. We've been uh, blessed with some good weather yesterday and today, but we've got a system out there, this lightning detection, that actually uh, sniffs the environment, the ions in the atmosphere, for about a 12-mile circumference around this campus. And when the conditions are favorable, to a lightning strike within two and a half miles of the campus, one of four of these lightning detection systems will go off. And so it constantly monitors all the time. We don't have to do anything. We have four of those on campus, so you can hear them anywhere on campus if you're outside, and uh, it will let you know with a long siren that there is uh, lightning in the area. And if it's clear, then it will, it will send out another alert, which are three short siren blasts to let you know it's all clear. We also have an emergency management team. I'm the chair of the uh, policy team. We have a policy team and emergency management team. What that means is, is anytime there's an event that could occur on campus that might affect the campus, we assemble and we discuss what that means for us and what it means for the students. We want to be on the front end of this to plan how we can manage this appropriately without uh, any impact of the campus, or if there is an impact of the campus, that we can make it minor. So, for example, we get questions a lot of times, especially from those of you that aren't from Florida, what do you do on a hurricane? Well, hurricanes no longer sneak up on us. We know well in advance that a hurricane's <laughs> coming. So we will plan, and eventually, or sometimes we have to evacuate the campus. We are not a shelter-in-place campus. So we will, if there's a hurricane that's predicted to come here, we will evacuate the campus. But we will make that call through the uh, policy team and the emergency management team well in advance so we don't want your students to travel in a storm. So 72 hours, 96 hours, somewhere around there, we will, we will make the call that we're going to evacuate the campus. If they cannot leave and go home, then we have shelters throughout the county that they can go to, emergency shelters. So uh, we ask that your student update their information constantly so we can get a hold of them. If they change a cell phone number or something like that, they need to go back online and change their information so that we can have that. This, I've discussed this uh, yesterday, maybe y'all didn't hear me, not all of you heard me, but this is a new uh, custom app that we created this summer uh, through a company called App Armor. It's called Stetson Safety. It's free of charge for not only your students, but for you. Many years we've been asked, how can I get an emergency message of something that happens on campus when I'm not there? And, and in the past we had to say we couldn't do that for you because the, the system we had did not allow that. Now you can. So mom and dad, if you want to upload this application, it's free of charge on any smartphone, Apple or Google. You can go in there and upload this information. And this will give you the ability to receive any messages, emergency messages, uh, it will send you news feeds on things that are happening on campus, uh, and we also encourage the students to do this as well. This is what it looks like when you upload that program. It's a great program, good resources.
if you haven't seen this app, please, I encourage you to go to either Google or uh, the, the Apple Store and, and upload that information for you. It's free again, very good information, and we also encourage your students to do that as well. Colleen? So we're going to shift gears just a little bit, um, and to introduce this topic, I'm going to ask a question. Um, so how many of you have ever gotten a speeding ticket? Raise your hand. All right, quite a few of you, but congratulations to those of you that don't. Very responsible. Now, I'm sure that if you had told that police officer when he pulled you over that you did not know the speed limit, he would have just crumpled that ticket up and thrown it right away. Because not knowing, totally okay. No, that is not okay. So, we have, like any community, have policies and procedures that have to be abided by to be a part of this community. Um, so, our code of community standards is actually in your student's planner, if they picked one of those up yesterday. It's also available online at any time. Um, they're going to, those of, those of you that have students that are living on campus, if they attend a first hall floor meeting, they're going to go over those. They're also going to attend a rights and responsibilities session during their focus orientation. So, they are going to cover a lot of these rules and regulations in those different learning opportunities. However, there are quite a few. They cannot all be covered, but it is an expectation that your student knows what those are because they will be held responsible for them. Um, the, one of the biggest challenges I think that we encounter is always students who say, oh, well, I didn't know. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean, like, if you told a cop, I didn't know I was driving that fast, it's possible you may or may not get the ticket but you could still be held accountable for it. So just keep that in mind, especially when you're getting that phone call from your student saying, hey, I broke a rule and this is the consequence of that. So you've heard a lot about you're a coach for your student, you're a cheerleader for your student, you're partners with us. Well, we're gonna use another analogy, you are co-pilots. You are co-pilots today and you are co-pilots for the rest of their education here. And what that means is you have skills, you have knowledge that are extremely valuable to them and valuable to us. However, the thing to keep in mind is that you are co-pilots. Your student is also a pilot, um, and they need to advocate for their own safety. You'd be shocked and amazed how many people burn popcorn the first month of school because they think it takes 10 plus minutes to cook it. <laughs> so, fire safety, personal safety. Um, these are all important conversations to have with your student and to reinforce that they are their biggest advocate. So in your conversation with them, if they, if they are personally experiencing something that they feel is unsafe or that they witness it, um, someone else experiencing it, please encourage them to tell someone. Um, we want your students to be an empowered bystander. We want them to speak up and we want to make sure that they feel safe at all times. So safety from another perspective. Um, this is the age of information. Online safety is a whole different ball game. Uh, in hopefully four years, your student will be going on to bigger and better things. That may be graduate school, that may be getting a job after college, um, but one of the things that we always like to communicate in our career and professional development team does a great job of educating our students on, be very cautious about what you're posting online. Um, do your research. Trust your gut. If something seems fishy, it probably is. Um, so they really want to be careful about what they're posting. Think before you post pictures, think before you post comments. Because while they might think that it's private or that their settings, no one can ever see that information, it's accessible. Um, and the last thing they want is to hear from an employer that they didn't move forward for a position because of something they posted on their social media while they were in college. Um, so have that conversation with your student, encourage them to be cognizant of what their privacy settings are and what sites they join online. Okay, Title IX. Uh, just so you know, if you haven't heard of it, Title IX of the Education Amendments of uh, 1972 is a federal civil rights law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in federally funded education programs. We are federally funded here. So it originally started out in 72 to prevent discrimination in, in a lot of athletic events and things like this to make sure people were treated fairly. But now it's, it's, it's moved into over the years into basically covering all of the university and all of the functions that we do here. So all public and private elementary, secondary schools, school districts and colleges must comply with Title IX. So what is that? Uh, it requires that we respond to and investigate allegations of any sexual violence, including but not limited to sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, 
things like this, anything in between. We get calls all the time. While some of them might not be a Title IX violation, we look at these, these calls for service as it potentially could be, and we treat it as such until we either rule it in or rule it out. So we take this very, very seriously. We must protect the complainant and ensure their safety. Sometimes that means we'll move somebody to another room. Uh, we'll make prompt steps uh, once the school has notice of an allegation. We have a certain time frame that we have to investigate then and reach a conclusion. We follow up and update the parties involved. We want to make sure that they're well informed. And then we're going to share the resources and information with all that are involved. And, and we have resources there that are available. I won't read through them all, but basically, I mean, we support the student through their uh, Title IX complaint, up to and including uh, law enforcement if they want to do that. It's strictly up to them. We encourage them. We provide the resources that they need. And then they're adults and they make the decisions. Sometimes we, ha we help them along the way, but it's their decisions. So we're there to help them through this. So obviously Title IX has been a hot topic in the news for the last couple of years. In spring of 2015, we uh, actually, our sets and students got together and decided to put together a video to encourage our community to take this topic seriously. It's time to step up, Stetson. It's time to make this campus safe. And welcoming for everyone. It's time to open our eyes to this reality and take the necessary steps toward change. For college students, 95% of incidents go unreported. One in five women and one in 16 men are sexually assaulted in college. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, 60% of rape and sexual assault go unreported. It's time to step up and talk about these issues. If someone does not consent, it's sexual assault. It's time to step up because this could happen to your best friend. Your roommate. A teammate. Your sister. I'm a brother. This could happen to you. We have to look out for each other. Because this is our school. And these people are our family. And this campus is our home. It's time to stop being a bystander. And be strong when we have to. Say something when we need to. And step up whenever we can. There is help everywhere. You just have to ask for it. And encourage those around you to do the same. It's time to step up, Stetson. So we obviously take this issue very seriously here at Stetson, um, and I don't even know if you realized it, but we started the education with your student before they even got here. Um, so hopefully by now they will have completed the first year Think About It course, which educates your student on alcohol, other drugs, and sexual violence. Um, if they haven't, don't worry, we'll be calling and emailing them continuously until they do. So please remind them to finish it. Uh, but it is a great program in which they actually follow a series of avatars through different scenarios that they could potentially experience in college. Uh, and they get to make the choices for these avatars and then in turn they get information back based on what their responses are. So it's an excellent program. It takes about three hours. Hopefully most of them have already done it. Some of you might have been sitting next to them while they did it. So you got the educational materials too. Uh, empowered bystander training, that was mentioned in the video. We do a lot of training throughout the year about encouraging your students to speak up. Speak up for themselves and speak up for others because we are one community, one family. Speakers will also have programs throughout the year, um, which include some nationally recognized programs, Take Back the Night, an opportunity for survivors or supporters of survivors to share their stories, a clothesline project where we design and decorate t-shirts and hang them throughout campus, bringing awareness to this issue, and then Walk a Mile in Our Shoes, where our males really take on this issue, um, put on some high heels and see what it's like to walk in their shoes. We get some great pictures from that. You can see them on the top right. Um, our males really are very supportive and get involved in this day. We also do a lot of promotional campaigns and then obviously basic self-defense. We want your student to understand and know what it's like to be in this situation, understand how to prevent these types of things from happening, um, but then also be supportive if we might have survivors on campus. So confidentiality on campus. For your students' protection, we do not use social security numbers. We use their 800 number. Uh, some of you might have even noticed that their 800 number is actually on their student ID card. Um, legally, your student, they are 18 years or older and they are considered an adult. Some of you might not be 18 yet, but if they are 18, they are considered an adult. So we do not disclose information about the student's ac academic and financial record or any health-related information. Uh, because they are over the, 18, the age of 18, we are unable to do that. 
Now switching gears, the secondary piece of this presentation was the first one was safety. Now we're going to switch to healthy campus. And that was alluded to in the residential life um, presentation about some of these issues. Every two years, we participate in the National College Health Assessment, in which our students complete a series of questions, and it gives us feedback of the health of our population. And we compare that to what some of the national uh, numbers are, as well as our numbers. We've participated in it, in, in it three or four times already. So these are the top 10 health impediments to learning for Stetson students. Um, this is the t fall 2015 data. So this is just this past fall. You can see that stress and anxiety are the top two, sleep following closely thereafter. And all of those things were kind of alluded to that these might be things that your student struggles with when they're here. Um, that's why we highly encourage them to utilize the resources that are available to them and focus on their well-being. Um, it's not just their job, it's everyone's. And we want to make sure that they have a great experience here. Um, one of the things I think I hear the most often through our wellness education is they all know how much they should sleep and how often they should sleep. However, it's like a shield of armor for them to say, I pulled an all-nighter, or I didn't sleep last night, or I got two hours of sleep last night. Um, so it's something that's uh, a coveted um, Thing to do and I think that one of the things we do a lot is education around them knowing well that's actually not really a healthy practice it's you're impeding your learning when you're doing those things they know it they know it's happening but they're still doing it so just reinforcing that positive behavior um, can go a long way so one of the initiatives we do specifically around promoting student wellness is we use them um, as social influencers. Um, so these students are nominated by their peers uh, and f to pick an issue that they are passionate about and then challenge what are their perceptions on campus. So it's a social norms campaign where we take statistics that are what people think is happening, and then we actually show them what actually is happening. So you can see we've done one on the top left, it's about um, relationships, and then we have quite a few of these. We do about 12 a year, they're posted around campus, so they see their fellow students on these posters promoting positive health behaviors. This poster gets its own slide because it has not changed in eight years since we've been doing all of these assessments. It shows the correlation between how much students drink and how it affects their academic performance. Um, we plaster this poster all over the place because obviously, first and foremost, they are students and their academics are important. We want them to have a great time, we want them to enjoy their college experience, but these things are directly linked and we know that through our data. Um, so we wanna make sure that they understand what that balance is um, and that Again, they're having a safe and responsible experience. So campus resources, kind of just to wrap this up um, and lead into questions, there are lots of resources available to your student when it comes to their health and safety. Um, you can see some of those. I particularly work out of the Hollis Center, which is probably where you started this lovely weekend at check-in. Uh, and we have lots of opportunities for them to get involved, to be active, to stay active during their time here. Uh, the Counseling Center you heard from Rachel earlier, um, they again have a lot of great resources for your student. Uh, health services, public safety, and accessibility services. So encourage them to utilize us. We're here for them. We want them to walk away having the most amazing time at Stetson ever. And anything we can do to help that, we want to make sure we're providing. Are there any questions? Yeah. Fire drills, we do those every semester. Uh, sometimes the student don't like that because, as Colleen was talking about, the, uh, the popcorn issues and things like that. They get enough fire drills without us doing the regular fire drills. They will cook their popcorn for 30 minutes, and when it's on fire, they realize it's done. So, but we do have scheduled fire drills uh, every semester, and uh, the RAs in the next week or so will be going over that, showing them where their assembly points are, and uh, we'll make sure that we do that. And uh, the RAs are trained also as far as the fire extinguisher protocol, and they will pass that on to the students as well. As far as hurricane drills and things like that, we, we really don't drill with hurricane stuff. We put information out in advance if there is a storm or something coming on what they need to do. We do have resources on our website that talk about a hurricane preparation kit, things like that for severe weather, uh, stuff that they can stock up on. But, you know, if a hurricane's coming, again, like I said, it's not going to sneak up on us. We'll start, we'll start talking about storm preparedness well in advance before that hurricane gets here.
Well, that's a good question. One, I mean, I don't think students are drinking more. I think we're, we're, we're documenting more information. The, uh, uh, you know, one of the issues that we have is uh, when, we, when we first started looking at information through the RAs and one of the mistakes that we made uh, was that when they were counting offenses, they were looking at if they went into a dorm room and there was a drinking offense there, they would count that as one. And we found that out after the fact, and it might not be one, it's because it's one room, but there was five people in there. And all five of those could have been underage, so that's five instead of one. So the, so the numbers changed a little bit. We now go through and make sure that we, we, we look at the numbers and actually compare them with the RA reports that they have out there so we, we make sure our information is 100% accurate. So we will go through and, and, and reconcile our records compared to the RA records uh, to make sure that we capture all the information. So I don't think the drinking's changed, I just think we do a better job at capturing it. Yeah, so online safety is one of those really difficult topics to tackle because there's so many different ones. We do do um, a lot of different education on online safety, but it comes from all different angles. So I, I kind of touched on the career and professional development, doing it from a like seeking a job perspective. Um, we also do it in uh, some other ways, on like what they post on Twitter, what they post on Snapchat, what they um, share on Facebook. So we do a lot on like the big ones. Um, I think doing one overall just on like the World Wide Web, we try and target the ones we know are hot topics and issues that students are handling each year um, versus a broad general one. Most of those end up to be being conversations versus us presenting um, just because they have questions or they want to know certain things about certain social media sites. So um, yes, absolutely. They also will get that through their um, RAs if they live on campus. They do a lot of educational programs around those different social medias. Not to, not to just take anything away from this. We, we, we are a, a beautiful campus. We, we enjoy a relative safe environment, but we have two major roadways that come through here. So any given day, there could be somebody driving by here that could you know, potentially pull in here to this campus. So we do take that very seriously, and we, you know, that's why we have the patrols that we do. And, and yes, it's something that we think about all the time. These, these severe thunderstorms, we do, have, we do have the alerts that come into our public safety office, and we have the ability to put out an emergency message within a matter of a few seconds that will go to the students' uh, you know, cell phones or whatever that will, that will allow them to know there's a notice out there. As far as sirens that we have for tornadoes, no, we don't have those here. Uh, we're not like out in the Midwest where they have these severe tornadoes. Not that we're exempt from them, but you know, we just do not have the, uh, the seriousness of those here. I mean, it could happen. It's happened in Daytona before, but we, you know, we feel like with our emergency messaging system, if we get the notice, we can get that information out as quick as we can. I mean, if, if, if there is a tornado, we will, we will direct them to a center portion on the ground floor of a building that, that, that you know, has, has a lot of structural integrity. Uh, a lot of the buildings have been here for a long time. There are some, some hardened areas in, in these buildings. While we're not storm rated, there are areas of a building that are safer than other areas. We don't want them out in, a, in an area that's got a lot of glass or things like this. So we'll bring them into a center portion of a building and, and let them wait the storm out there. Yes. The protocol we have for active shooter, we, uh, we prescribe to a, a, a video that we're going to show all the students. As a matter of fact, I think it's on Wednesday. It's called Run, Hide, Fight. Uh, it's, uh, it's titled When Lightning Strikes, and it's a 30-minute video that talks about, you know, what they need to do. Of course, the safest place to be in an active shooter is somewhere else, you know. So if you don't need to be here, don't be here. But if you can't leave, then you need to be able to hide, and we talk about how they can hide and, 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 and you know, secure an area that they are. We make sure that, you know, like, like I said, their, their dorm rooms lock, uh, their classrooms lock, and, and unfortunately, the last resort is if you can't do anything else and that, that person comes into where you are, then you need to be prepared to fight, and that's something that, you know, we talk about, but the decision is, is on them. I can't tell them when to do that. I can only give them examples on why that would be appropriate, but we do go through a training program, and it's mandatory for all the students, so they will see that, I think it's Wednesday. Clearly, we, we want the students to enjoy themselves here, and our, our hope is that at the end of four years, I like to, to, to use this phrase, that they leave here with no permanent scars, marks, or tattoos, because we don't want you to be unhappy with us. So if they get in trouble here and we can manage it on the campus, we'll manage it on the campus without them being arrested. Uh, so for minor offenses, misdemeanor offenses, things like that, we're able to, in, in conjunction with the local law enforcement here, work through the process here with uh, 
putting them into a program to educate them on why that you know isn't appropriate and things like that. If it becomes a felony offense, of course, then then uh, you know all bets are off and we turn that over to local law enforcement. But the majority of them uh, are are able to be handled here. Now, some of the offenses that occur. Uh, adjacent to the campus that we report. They might be downtown and be arrested for a, a liquor law violation, and, and we have to count that, but, uh, you know, that's, that's out of our control. If it happens here and we can manage it here, we will, as long as it's a misdemeanor. If it's a felony, well, then we, we, don't, uh, we don't put them in, well, we might put them into a program here, but we're going to count it, and it'll be an arrest. Yeah, so our self-defense actually has been a partnership with public safety and wellness and recreation. So we have brought someone in from the community um, that was previously in law enforcement and provided them with strategies for situations like that. So it's actually kind of a partnership through both of us. Yeah, so we have AED machines around campus at certain locations. So the Holla Center, the building I work in, since it's a fitness facility, there's actually two in the facility, one in the pool deck and one um, behind the front desk. There's one outside this door Bob just mentioned. So we do have um, first aid equipment. Also public safety, their response time is excellent. We have quite a few student leaders that are also required to have CPR, first aid, and AED certifications for their positions through the American Red Cross. Um, in addition, lifeguards having a pool on campus, they also are professional rescuers. So we have quite a few students that have elevated um, medical skills, um, not to the level of obviously EMS, but yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Wellness and Rec actually offers them. Um, students just have to express interest either by emailing us or stopping by our building, the Hollis Center, and saying they're interested in uh, attending a CPR or first aid class. If it is not a requirement for their position, there's usually a small fee, but it's nothing in comparison to what they would do getting it out in the community. I believe it's like $30 right now. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank, Thank you, you guys. so much. Thank you.